that's something new, man. What we're going to do is we're going to bring out a book every single week. We're going to bring out a book and we're going to tie it into the law. You understand? And so today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be bringing out a book by Gunnar Murdoch. And this book by Gunnar Murdoch is called An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in Modern Democracy. And this is a, a, this is a great book. Um, if you are, if you a brother um, or a sister that's looking for some good information to put in your arsenal, then this is definitely uh, where you want to go when it, uh, this is definitely where you want to go um, if you want to get some, um, some good um, things to put in your arsenal. Um, when you go out, you know, if you're a brother and you're going out on the streets or whatever, this is definitely something that you want to have, all right? So I'm going to just make sure that, uh, that the feed is up before I get started. Make sure the feed is up real quick. All right. Give me one second, y'all. So like, yeah. Make sure it's up real quick. All right, so it seems like everything is in order. And tonight, um, the classes in Wilmington, Delaware are Tuesday through Friday, right? 7 to 9 p.m. And then also um, on uh, Saturday, we have a Sabbath service from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. So if you were in any of the surrounding cities, this is where you need to be. You understand? And, we, we, and, and you, want, you, you want to check out the, um, the uh, um, Hebrew class that Mataza Pa teaches on Friday nights. Because it's a, it's a very, very good class, and it'll get you ready um, for the Sabbath service that we have on Saturday. It'll get you re ready so that you can follow along and you, you'll be able to read and different things like that. So tonight, like I said, I wanted to go into um, Gunnar Murdoch. And Gunnar Murdoch was a Swedish eugenicist, right? Um, he was a Swedish eugenicist, and he was financed by the Carnegie Corporation. All right, so I'm going to read a little bit about Gunnar Murdoch, um, just so y'all can get an understanding of who I'm talking about, all right? An American Dilemma, the Negro Problem in Modern Democracy, is a 1944 study of race relations um, authored by Swedish eugenicists, and uh, he was actually an economist, too. Now, Gunnar Murdoch, he was, a, he was an economist, and he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize. Right. So he was financed by the Carnegie Corporation to give an unbiased look on the Negro problem in America. The reason that they wanted him to do it was because they didn't want somebody who already had been bought or they didn't want somebody who would already be swayed to one specific side by their preconceived notions about black people. So what they did was they went searching um, for, for different people that they could put to make the study. And they went through a lot, a lot of people. And they ended up settling on Gunnar Murdoch because of his research, because of the type of, um, um, you know, research work he's done in the past. And also what people got to understand is that Gunnar Murdoch is deeply rooted in eugenics. And eugenics is, was uh, coined, that term was coined by Francis Galton. Francis Galton was the, I guess you would say, the father of eugenics. And the idea of eugenics is where... The, they believe that the world is overpopulated, so you have to get rid of the people that are feeble-minded, the people that are poor, the people that are, you know, d disabled, um, and, you know, different things like that, different um, particulars about certain people that they, want, that they want to get rid of and rid the world of. But the thing is, black people fall under so many of those ca categories that... When they come with eugenics, it's not about them killing off their own people. It's always about um, them killing off blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. That has always been the game in, in here, and it was the game back in the time of Egypt, right? So we're going to read. I'm going to give you some more information about um, Gunnar Murdoch. Now, this book right here is called An American Dilemma. It's about a 1,500-page book. That um, you could you could get now on Amazon. I think it might be roughly around like maybe fifty bucks. But the thing is, you got to be careful when you get like books like this because they might try to give you a revised version, a version where they take out certain stuff that might be a little bit too edgy for today's time. So you want to make sure. Go ahead. I also want to 
also have the PDF? Yeah, well, uh, Mataza Pa has the PDF. And so you can reach out to Mataza Pa. Um, you know, you can hit up his, his Gmail or you can hit up the video on Facebook or YouTube right now. And you can, um, you know, just write it in the comments and we'll um, see the comments, of course. And we'll um, send you a link that you can go to to get the PDF and then you can get it printed out and bind it or whatever you want. But you always want to try to, um, well, not always, I mean, well, you should always want to try to make sure that you get the right version. Because a lot of these books that are deep, right, what they'll try to do is they'll try to revise the version. So many different times. So you'll get a book that says An American Dilemma, but it might be the third edition or the fourth edition or something like that. And the things that I'm going to bring out in this book is, you know, the one that you want to have. All right. So um, Gunnar Murdoch, he was funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. The foundation chose Murdoch because it thought that as a non-American, he could offer a more unbiased opinion. Murder's volume at nearly... Um, Myrtle's volume at nearly 1,500 pages painstakingly de detailed what we saw as obstacles to, to full participation in American society that American blacks faced as of the, the um, 1940s. Ralph Bunch uh, served as Gunnar Myrtle's main researcher and writer of the start of the project in the fall of 1938. It sold over 100,000 copies and went through 25 printings before going into his second edition in 1965. We happen to have the first edition, all right? It was enormously inf influential in how racial issues were viewed in the United States, and it was cited, as, cited in a landmark Brown versus Board of Education case. In general, the book was generally positive in its outlook on the future of race relations in America, all right? Murder believe, Murdoch believed... Um, he saw a uh, vicious cycle. Is, is, the two, is the pictures up there on the thing? Okay. Murdoch believed that he saw a vicious cycle in which whites oppressed blacks and then, pointed, and then pointed to blacks' poor performance as a reason for the oppression. Now, we see this is how we've always been looked at in America. We've always been looked at that our condition is because we put ourselves in our position. And we don't do enough and that's why we're being oppressed and that's totally wrong and totally false we are living in a time now where blacks Hispanics, and native americans have to understand that the position that you're in and the oppression that we face here in america is not your fault you know what i'm saying and what we're here to do in the ishpk is to show you to deeply show you how the think tanks that were put out there to oppress blacks Hispanics, and native americans is bigger than what you could conceive and so what we're going to break down is some of these things in this book today. All right. It says he pointed out that blacks poor performance as a poor performance for a reason for the oppression. The way out of this cycle, he argued, was to either one, um, either cure whites of the prejudice he believed existed or to improve the circumstances of blacks would would then disprove whites preconceived notions. So if so, what they're saying is that if they got us out of this situation, then that would disprove all the things and the preconceived notions that white people already have about black people. And we know what those preconceived notions are. And those those preconceived notions are that we are inferior. You know what I mean? Or that we are, you know, thugs or we're criminals or we're just people who can't seem to get ourselves together. Right. And those are preconceived notions that we all face here in America today, and we face these same things back in the 1930s and the 1940s, all right? It says, according to Murdoch, the American dilemma of his time referred to the coexistence of the American liberal ideas and the miserable situation of blacks. On one hand, enshrined in the American creed is the belief that people are created equal and have human rights. While on the other hand, blacks, um, blacks as one tenth of the population were treated as in as an inferior race and were denied numerous civil and political rights. Because if you look at the what eugenics is, and you look at those deeply rooted racism that is merged with science, 
you see that when you look to the bottom of it and when you finally get to the bottom of it, you find out that it's about about them saying that we're we're inferior. You know what I mean? And they try to use it from they try to come at it from a scientific um, angle to say that we're inferior. That's where you get the whole thing where they say that black people are monkeys. We came from monkeys and all that kind of stuff. And they try to equate us to monkeys and all that other kind of stuff throughout history because they've always felt that we were inferior. And matter of fact, even Abraham Lincoln, when Abraham Lincoln wrote, wrote a speech in 1864, that was one of the things that he said in his speech where he said that, you know, he didn't want to make drawers out of black people. He didn't want black people to hold political office or any of those things when he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. You understand? And he always wanted the inferior, the master race to be afforded to the white people and the inferior race afforded to the black people. All right. So it says Murdo's encyclopedic study covers every aspect of black white relations in the United States. Up to, up to his time, he frankly concluded that the Negro problem is a white man's problem. That is, whites as a collective were responsible for the disadvantageous situation in which blacks were trapped. All right? Now, the American creed. The American creed is the idea that everybody's created equal. And we understand in 2021 that there is no equality. Because we've been trying to fight for equality from a people that we're not equal to. In fact, the scripture says that we're above these people in Deuteronomy 7 and 3. Right? And if, if you could if you could pull that for me real quick, um, if, if you could pull that for me, Matazapa, uh, Deuteronomy 7 and 7 and 3. I got uh, uh, like 7 and 6. 7 and 6, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 7 and 6, all right? And then I'm gonna move on. All right. Now no, okay, you got it. Deuteronomy 7 and 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. Uh-huh. says, for thou art in holy people. Right, the thou is us, the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. The Lord is saying that we are in holy people. What does it mean to be holy? What it means to be holy is to be separate. And the Lord is saying that we are a separate people. Read on. For thou art in holy people uh -huh. unto Yahweh thy power. Right, unto the most high power. Right, read on. Yahweh thy power has chosen thee. The Lord has chosen us. Read on. To be a special people. To be a special people. Read on. Unto himself. Unto the Lord. Right? Because that's our portion here on the earth is the most high. Read on. Above. What? Say that one more time. Above. Uh-huh. All people. Now, it ain't no equality in somebody that's above all people. There's no equality in that. The problem is we're fighting for the wrong thing. What we should be fighting for is rulership. What we should be fighting for is to be in complete power and have the rest of these nations in these nations in subjection under our boots. That's what we should be fighting for. We should not be fighting for uh, equality to be equal with a murderer. That's not what we should be doing. And actually, is to the contrary, is very um, counterproductive. All right. The first thing we have to understand. With this whole Negro project, right? Because that's what this book is called. It's called the Negro Project, right? So I want to read y'all something. It says, now this is crazy. When I first, when I read this, I was like, wow, there it go right there. It says, there were no African Americans in the 1940s. The term African American was invented after 1970. This is not an anarchical, hold on, hold on, let me see, anach, anachronism. Right, anachronism is anything that is out of out of time and out of place. And anachronism, as African Americans refer refers to roughly the identical categorization of people under under the unscientific rubric, right, which is the title of skin color, as words like Negro or Black. It does not make any categorical difference except semantically that is in the context of political correctness or terminology um that denigrates uh, that denigrates per persons who fall under such rubric which is like a title so basically what it's saying is that the the term african-american it doesn't fit this time right because how can you rename a, a people in at in from 1970 to two to two thousand, 
You know what I mean? How can you name a people that has already existed way before 1970? So just the idea of saying that we're African Americans or Negroes or anything like that is it, it, it only works semantically, meaning like in language, because it doesn't have any validity to it and it doesn't have anything backed by it. And so that's why we don't we don't get the, the necessary justice that we're looking for is because we don't have the rule of law and also we don't have an identity. And that's why it's so important that you learn your identity and you come in here so that we can teach it to you properly. All right. So I'm going to go a little bit more into um, Gunnar Murdoch. All right. Now, it says the book uh, that was ultimately published in 1944, this book right here. Over six years after the Carnegie Corporation president, Frederick Capel, uh, invite, invited Swedish eugenic, uh, economist and eugenicist Gunnar Murdahl to lead a comprehensive study of the Negro in the United States. Now, it says the problem of race for Murdahl was a moral issue and not just a matter of preventing racial clashes or modernizing the South. So when he wrote this book, it was not to try to moder mo um, modernize the South. It was not to try to end none of the racial tensions that was going on in America at the time. All he was doing was just simply writing it down and researching it. And giving the unbiased look that they wanted him to give. So, that, so basically it's a research book on every facet of black life. And we're going to go into some of it, all right? But I'm just giving y'all a little bit more of the backstory. So it says, at the time, although uh, Capel, and Capel is, was the, uh, uh, was the, um, was the Carnegie Corporation's president at the time. So it says, um, at the time, Capel and his advisors were aware that black-white relations were changing and needed a new kind of attention. They did not aim to end segregation or take on the economic and social conditions of blacks. So they did not write this book as a way to try to help the situation. They just was doing research on it. And that just shows you how everybody benefits off of our oppression. Even if it comes to writing a book, even if it comes to selling us something, everybody benefits off of our oppression and nobody tries to change it, right? Um, in 1935, Keppel's advisor, Newton Baker, who had been the mayor of Cleveland at the time from 1913 to 1916, right? Baker spoke publicly against discrimination. He referred to blacks as an infant race. Now... When you look, when you look around, there is, as which you would see that other the way other nations treat us, there is some truth to that, right? Because these other nations they treat us like an infant race. Right. Now, when you go into the store, right? You go into the store, they got all the blunts you need, all the different colors, all the different you know flavors. You know, they treat us like kids. You know, they got the counter super high in the air and you can't even see over top of the counter and they over top of you looking down on you, serving you whatever the hell you want all goddamn day, uh, day in and day out, hand over, making money hand over fist. They treat us like kids in this place. When the cops stop you, what they say? Hey, boy, where you going? What you doing? And what do we say? Man, we got it. I got in trouble yesterday, right? Because in America, that's what we're treated as, the infant race. And that's why nobody, no, nobody respects a child, when it, like adults. Adults is not going to respect a child. And so what we have to do is we have to start understanding where we are and who we, who we are and where we're going at so that we can step into the role of being, you know, men and being women. Because when we, when we go out and we, uh, and we uh, what's that word I'm looking for, where we, 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 we degrade ourselves. When we degrade ourselves, that's how these, these other nations look at us. Like, well, I can't, I can't come to work without having to go over here and break up a fight amongst black people. That's how a cop feels when he comes to work. Like, I got to go over here. I got to stop because they won't stop shooting each other. They won't stop selling drugs. They're just like kids. So, in, in turn, that's what we have in America, that paternalistic relationship. And so, these are the things that we need to change to make our situation better here. And the only way you're going to learn that is through the ISUPK, man. You know, to come in here, learn, and get yourself right, and be who the most, the most high wanted you to be, right? So it said that he referred to us as an infant race. 
These in in inconsistencies demonstrate the dilemma Murder Murdoch would write about. All right. Um. All right. So I'm gonna give you some more. The time. Um. After the search through the list that included 25 names, Capel chose Gunnar Murdoch, the Swedish economist. Then 39 years. Then 39 years old, in the invitation of, to Murdoch, Keppel wrote that Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation wanted someone who would approach the situation with an entirely fresh mind. We, he, we have um, also thought that it would be wise to seek a man in a non-imperialistic country with no background of domination of one race over another. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? Murder, Murdoch, who, who would go on to win the 1974 Nobel Peace Prize in economic science, arrived in New York to begin the work in, in September 1938. All right. Um, of course, I'm, I'm just giving y'all the whole backdrop on Gunnar Murdoch. Another key facet of Murdoch's argument was, was to set the study in an international context. Murdoch also thought that the treatment of blacks in the U.S. would affect its international prestige and power. And he was right. Because when in the 1960s, when they were spraying water hoses, sicking dogs on people, and doing all those type of things in the street, beating people up who were just trying to march, those things made America look bad around the world. So what did America do? Being the devil that the Bible speaks of, they just went covert with racism. So it wasn't just the open, it wasn't just the open racism like we were seeing in the 60s and the 70s on TV. It wasn't like that. It was changed and it was redefined. So now racism ain't the cop shooting you with a, with a water hose and sicking the dogs on you. It is like that in some cases. But for the most part, what racism is now, it, it has been relegated down to the KKK. Or relegated down to the one racist cop who kills a black man. Right. The one racist cop who kicks your teeth in for not complying and getting down on the ground fast enough. That's what we see as racism. So we don't we see racism boiled down to just one specific person or one specific thing like the Ku Klux Klan and different things like that. And we don't understand that it's a systemic thing. You know what I mean? A systemic problem. So we don't look at racism on a broader level. And this, and, and this is why these classes are so important, so that we can help brothers and sisters to understand that. All right? Um, all right? So, in this study of this book, The American Dilemma, it said, uh, drew upon 31 commission research memoranda on every aspect of black life and interracial relations. And Marlon carried out extensive field research touring the country and talking with black and white leaders, journalists, school teachers, clergy, farmers, pastors, etc. Right? Now, what gave the study its impact? What gave the study its impact was a unique combination of Murdoch and, and, and Keppel. Made, and they made the, pro the project bolder and better able to affect po public policy uh, than it otherwise would have been. Keppel was an unusual was an unusual foundation president, personally involved operating one uh, in, uh, institution. He employed only a small staff and received many great applicants himself. And it goes in to talk about the different applicants that he had. One of them was W. B. Du Bois, right? And once he returned from his first tour of the South, he commented that he found the situation more shocking and, than he had expected and was overwhelmed by how little he knew. But he, he wrote in the report that he would need to redefine and scope the study since the American Negro as a social problem it included that it included in and includes all other American social, economic, and political problems. So it, it, did, it wasn't just a, 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 a study that, that when he first, when he seen the conditions of black people, he understood that it just couldn't be a study of just black people. It had to be a study of everything that involved with black people from our economic uh, standpoint, from our educational standpoint, from our, um, you can keep going, um, from 
uh, economics, like I said, economics from, um, you know, uh, a religious uh, background, from, you know, everything that involved with black people in America, he realized that that had to be in the study because we were affected by every single uh, thing that America um, every part of the system, I should say, every part of the system that America, uh, that, that was represented in America. All right. All right. So, um, check this out. Other key organizations such as the NAACP and the National Urban League and the, and the Commission on Interracial Relations, all which had received earlier grants from the corporation, but which had been uh, which had been told that they would not be funded further until after uh, the Murdoch study was completed. So these black groups that was getting money from the Carnegie Corporation, they had to wait until the study was over until they could get money. So what that did was that made them want to get involved with it to help the book come out a lot quicker so they can go back and get money. Right. So what I'm going to do is. I'm going to go into the book so that y'all can see some of, some of the things inside the book, right? And then this book is called An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in Modern Democracy, right? So we're going to read about some of the things that Gunnar Murdoch said, all right? Now, this is one of the things that if you a person who's um, watching right now, you know, or you watch this, this video when it comes out, one thing you, you have to know about this book is that this book was basically a think tank that showed how white people dealt with black people, what was needed to be done to control black people, and ultimately it was used as a standard to be able to go back to so that they could like win a case like Brown versus Board of Education and, they, and then certain women's rights issues when they went into this book and they was able to find certain things that you could you could, uh, you know, kind of key in on and use as an argument, right? This is one of the things. Now, remember, bef before I go on, Gunnar Murdoch was deeply rooted into eugenics. And eugenics led all the way up into the uh, Nazi party, right? And then after that, it just led all the way up into Planned Parenthood. And that's why you see a Planned Parenthood on every one of the blocks, damn near one of every every, every block that's close to the ghetto, because they make sure that they make uh, Planned Parenthoods in walking distance of the black neighborhood because they know we don't own vehicles and different things like that, right? So this is what he said. He said, the Negroes cannot, this is page 70. He said, the Negroes cannot be killed off. Compulsory deportation would infringe upon personal liberty in such a radical fashion that it is excluded. So he's saying that the Negroes in America, they can't be killed off. And compulsory deportation would infringe upon the personal liberty that it's excluded. So they understand that they just can't start deporting black people, right? They understood that. So he said it's, it, it's so radical that it's excluded. He said, voluntary exportation of Negroes could not be carried out extensively because of the unwillingness on the part of the recipient nations. So if we're Africans, then why ain't Africa wanting to take us back in a large number? Not, I'm not talking about go back to Ghana, you know, that kind of stuff you see on TV. Go, it's the, the year of return. Oh, man, look, don't be fooled by the year of return. Don't be fooled by none of that stuff, man. You understand? Because all it is is Africa wanting you to go back so that you can build up their economy, so that you can get Ghana popping because we got America popping. So if they can get us over there and they can exploit us too as well, like everybody else is exploiting us, then we can make Ghana, you know, one of those countries that's popping and everybody want to go for tourism. And that's the whole thing. That's the whole game, right? So it said, voluntary exportation of Negroes cannot be carried out extensively because of the unwillingness on the part of recipient nations, as well as on the part of the American Negroes themselves, who usually do not want to leave the country, but prefer to stay and fight it out here. Neither is it possible to effectuate the goal by keeping up the Negro death rate. So when it says they effectuate the goal, meaning it's neither is it possible to reach the goal that we want to reach by just keeping up the Negro death rate, right? 
a Negro, the Negro, um, a high death rate is an unhumanitarian and undemocratic way to restrict the Negro population. And in addition, expensive to society and dangerous to the white population. The only possible way of decreasing Negro population is by controlling means of fertility. And this is what they understood way back in the day. They understood that that's how you restrict the Negroes, by controlling fertility, by putting, spending billions of dollars on pamphlets that is pre-packaged with racism. You know what I mean? But they just put it in a way that makes it seem like it's that they're trying to help you, right. but really all it is is racist. It's just like um, something you would see in goddamn Germany somewhere. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, we just want to help. Just gotta see, we don't want to change. See, the thing is, they don't want to change our situation here in America. They just would rather you just kill your baby because you don't want to bring a baby to be under oppression because you're already being oppressed. So just... This is better just to get rid of the baby so he don't have to grow up in a hard life, in the ghetto, being hunted down by police officers, and, you know, and struggling through life. So the best thing to do is just to get rid of it. And that's what they've always been doing, spending billions and billions of dollars going to the black leaders. And so this is one of the things, this is the first point I wanted to bring out about Gunnar Murdoch was when he said that, you know, the, the way that you can restrict the Negro population is not by deporting them. Not by, you know, uh, killing them. Not by, you no, know, just, you know, just straight out just killing them in the streets. Not by, you know, all the different things you, that they use to kill black people. You, we can get rid of them. But, but hold on, Salagi. But, they, and they can't get, they can't leave because the other nations don't want them. So if Africa doesn't, if we're African and Africa doesn't want us in a law and don't want us there, then where the hell can you go? How can you deal with their numbers? And the way that you deal with their numbers is by con controlling the means of fertility, by procreation. And that's where you get all of the different groups that's out here today that's against cisgender, that's against, you know, the nuclear family, that's against straight males and straight women, right? And, and, and you know, and, and abortion, which is the, the number one killer in, in, in America of, of, of our people, Right? To the tune of 350,000. All right. It says, um, all right, this is page 171. It says, um, from practically any point of view, it will be better not to have certain children born at all rather than to have them die before completing a normal lifetime. And if healthy children are born, it is in the interest of everyone. Um, it, hold on. If and if healthy children are born, it is in the interest of everyone to see that they are given the opportunity to remain healthy. These considerations apply to both Negroes and whites, but they apply with greater forcefulness to Negroes, since differential death rates reveal the equalization of health conditions. Even without advance in medical knowledge or practice will pull the Negro death rate down sharply by just getting rid of your kids because... They're not going to lead. They're not going to live a good life anyway. So you might as well just leave them. And then that way, every you, you won't have them getting sick. And then being sick won't bring them down. And then these are the things that Gunnar Murdoch was talking about in this book, right? So I'm going to hit on a few things, and just so y'all, I'm going to give y'all something to you know go home with or whatever, so that you can research it yourself. All right, so this is page 566 in the Negro Project, an American Dilemma. He said another. Uh, there's another. He said there's a. It is often said that the decrease of lynching is only nominal, which means very small, or partly so. There are several substitutes for lynching. One is the killing of Negro criminals by police officers. Now, Matilda Paul always bring this out every every goddamn you know chance that he get when it talks about how the decrease in lynching is only you know it, it's just something that we don't see anymore because that substitute that we see for the lynching is what we see when we seen Tamir Rice get killed, right. when we seen Michael Brown get killed, when we seen, you know, uh, uh, Antoine Rose get killed, when we seen all of these different brothers and sisters who was killed by the police mercilessly, 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 right? That is the lynching. And he's saying this back in 1938, 39, 
This is what they were doing back in the in the thirties. They would kill black men who they perceived as being criminals. Because that's the one thing that they've all they always say. It was so many black men back in those times that was in jail for being criminals because they didn't have a job. Because remember, they had the vagrancy laws. All those different things. The vagrancy laws. If you didn't keep a job, um, you would go to jail. You know, if you was in a certain area at a certain time, you went to jail. You know, everything was, all the laws were put out there to criminalize, criminalize the black man. And so, when a black man would get killed by a cop, it would be looked at as it was the cop was doing a great thing and ridding the world of a criminal. And so this is where we get that new form of lynching from. And it just went down. And I hope everybody that's listening can at least understand this, that this book was written in the 1930s. And if when I'm reading you this stuff, you can completely see the similarities to what's still going on today. You know, Still going on over 70 years later, right? What, 80 years? About 70, 80 years? Going, still going on to this day, right? So it said that there are substitute, several, several substitutes for lynching. One is the killing of Negro criminals by police officers. Damn, that's in page 566, right? So we're reading about Gunnar Murdoch, the Swedish eugenicist that was financed by the Carnegie Corporation to do a research on blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, and to give an unbiased look on it, on the situation, so that the Carnegie Corporation could learn how to deal with the problem, how they could improve race relations between black people and white people. And we see even today that race relations between us is still the same. You know, they want to try to join us in a system that they don't even know if we want to even be involved with this system. But they force us to be in this system because we still are under the same systematic racism that we've always been under in America. And the only thing now than before is that now it's covert. It's you just can't see it right away. When you go outside, you don't see the racism right away because there's nobody kicking you in your ass. Right. But every time you go to the Chinese store, you see racism. Every time you go to the corner store, you're seeing racism. Every time you go to the liquor store, you're seeing racism. And you're seeing the oppression because we don't have those stores. You can't, we can't go into a liquor store and see our people in there. Well, we see our people working there, but we don't see our people in a dominant role. And then I think Matala Pai said it was like one uh, uh, black lady who had a liquor store, right? She had about three three bottles of liquor on the damn table, you know, on the, on the shelf, and none of our people went in there to patronize the liquor store, you know, because they they couldn't compete with the Arabs or the East Indians, right? So I'm gonna move on. All right, now now let's go to the church, right? Let's go to the church real quick. Now everybody know about Dylan Storm, where he walked, he went into the South Carolina AME church and he killed all those people and people was in there begging for their lives and he still killed them. He even walked over dead bodies and asked the people, did I shoot you yet? You know, and, and the horror that they had to endure for those, what well, I think it was eight to 11 minutes while he was in there unloading his goddamn weapon in them. It shot an old lady, probably like 11 times old lady. That was like, you know, in her eighties, right? Just, just disgusting and, and pitiful. But we're going to read what Gunnar Murdoch said about the white church. and the, No, the black church. Page 575. He said, Negroes are ordinarily never admitted to white churches in the South. But if a strange white man, Dylan Roof, a strange white man, Dylan Roof, a strange white man enters a Negro church the visit is received as a great honor. So remember when Dylan Storm, when Dylan Roof came into that church, what happened? They brought him into church and they took him up to the front and sat him next to the pastor. The minute that they started praying and they bowed their heels for prayer, he pulled out his gun and he started killing every damn body. And he started with the damn pastor, right? Because this is a strange man that's accepted by the black church. Now, y'all remember this book was written in the 1930s. So 
when this came out, this was a minute ago. So now, even today, we are still doing the same thing. And so it's always good to understand where you came from so that you don't so that you can know where you're going. And so you don't repeat the same things in history, right? So I'm going to read it one more time. It says, Negroes are ordinarily never admitted to the white churches in the South. But if a strange white man enters a Negro church, the visitor received as a great uh, honor. The guest will be ushered to the front seat of the platform, to the platform, and the service will often be interrupted. An announcement will be made that there is a white friend present, and we and he will be asked to address the Negro audience, which will loudly testify its high approval. And remember, we watched that show, um, uh, Active Shooter, on on what was that? Uh, Showtime, I believe. And when we watched it, and it showed how when Dylan Storm came up to that church, they took him up to the front and sat him next to the pastor. And they overly testified their joy that they had a white friend in the congregation. Because that's brainwashing that we've never gotten off of us since the damn, well, since slavery. Right? And I brought all of those things out, man. To I brought all those things out today. Um, you know, to 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 show us where we where we where we were at, and to show you that we haven't changed to where we are now. And this is the last thing I want to read, y'all. Right? This is page one sixty seven in the Negro Project, um, an American dilemma: the Negro problem in modern democracy by Gunnar Murdoch. It says, if we forget about the means for the moment, and consider only the quantitative goal for Negro population policy. There is no doubt that the overwhelming majority of white Americans desire that there be as few Negroes as possible in America. If the Negroes could be eliminated from America or greatly decreased in numbers, this would meet the whites' approval, provided that it could be accomplished by means which are approved, like Planned Parenthood, like all the things that is put out there to kill black people. And these are the things that we have to take into consideration and understand that these things are still going on now. And it says, um, it is considered a great misfortune for America that Negro slaves were ever imported. The pressure, the presence of Negroes in America is usually considered as a plight of the nation. There you go. And so I hope that this class, man, helped, um, helped y'all get some jewels that you can write down in your book. Like I said before, this book is called An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in Modern Democracy, uh, written by Gunnar Murdahl, who was a Swedish economist, and he was deeply rooted in eugenics. Eugenics, And these writings that he has in here, you understand, is was the four, the four, like the, it was the groundwork to Planned Parenthood. It was, the, it was, it was laid down to show the racism in America and to actually capture it in a time that we still living out today. And so, like I said, we're going to be doing these things every week. Um, next week, Mattel the is going to be up and he's going to be bringing out some, um, some heavy information and every brother or sister that's out there that's watching, you want to definitely make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you can get this powerful information for you brothers that's out there. You get these books, man. Put them in your arsenal. So when you go out on the streets, you'll have something that they can't refute. And th the one thing that black people can't refute is evidence from the white man. And with that being said, man, I'm going to say shalom and Lord be with everybody.